Jerry Meek is the founder and CEO of Desert Star Construction, a company dedicated to building an impressive variety of architectural styles, net zero energy and LEED certified homes in residential projects in the most luxurious communities across Phoenix, Paradise Valley, Scottsdale, and throughout Arizona. Known by clients and industry colleagues as the best team in the luxury home business, DSC has been recognized in dozens of magazines and earned honors such as multiple Gold Nugget Awards, Phoenix Home and Garden Home of the Year, Southwest Contractor, and NAHB Custom Home of the Year. In 2017, Jerry was the first ever luxury custom home builder to receive Phoenix Home and Garden's Master of the Southwest, an award program in its 30th year that recognizes the best in design and craftsmanship. Jerry served as the founding president of the Phoenix Dream Center Foundation, an organization that helps survivors of human trafficking, and he is the founder of Glorious Reflections, an online community that helps overwhelmed Christian business leaders rediscover their eternal purpose and find unending joy in their life and leadership. Jerry and I share a passion for motivating people to dream big and live a life of greatness, and it's an honor to have him on the show. Welcome, Jerry, and thanks for joining us on Life Excellence. Thank you so much, Brian. It's an honor to be here. It's taken us a while to connect, but I'm glad it's now. I'm, I'm glad you're here, too. Thanks for being here. Jerry, I've seen some of the homes you've built, and words like stunning and spectacular don't even begin to describe them. I think we've included some video of one of your homes for those watching the show on YouTube. I have to imagine that, especially in upscale areas around Scottsdale and Paradise Valley, you're not the only luxury home builder. What does DSC do that other builders don't do? that has caused you to differentiate yourself and become the company that some of the most financially successful people in the world choose to build what you call their personal resort? I think the biggest thing we do is we've got a foundation of integrity. My dad taught me the only thing I would ever own is my integrity, and I had to keep working on it. So many of the builders, there are, there are some other good builders, and I don't want to say there's not because there are, and we are in relationship with them. I think what differentiates us, Brian, is that integrity is not just structural integrity, but it's personal integrity with our team and our trade contractors. And we just create really great experiences for our clients. They can choose anybody, they, anybody in the world that they want to come build their home. And they've asked us to be stewards of that vision for them. And we feel like with the 46 years of experience, we're uniquely qualified to do it. Well, in the marketplace, obviously, uh, has shown that you are. Jerry, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned a friend who eventually wants to build a house in Scottsdale, and you said you were so busy that it would be years before you could get to him. Give us an idea of the type and scope of projects that you're working on these days. Wow, that's a big question. I've got to go through my mind and see which ones I can actually talk about because of non-disclosures. Um, we have... Not really done advertising per se. It's been word of mouth. Our clients recommend their friends to us. The types of projects, I think every year get more complex, more detailed, and set us inflation aside. They're just more money because of the size and detail. I think the complexity has gone up. And frankly, our the homes that we build, we call them personal resorts. It's our trademark of what we build. And I came from a commercial background early on, and I didn't like it. All they cared about was getting in the project, didn't care about quality, and it was all about price. I figured we can balance those things out. We've done a good job at that. But we have one project that's over 40,000 square feet. We've got one that's at 50,000 square feet. We've got a really cool one that's 6,000 square feet. So for us, and there's many more beyond that, but for us, it's we're at a point in our business career where we get to choose who we work with. They have a choice, but so do we. You know, when I was starting out, Brian, anybody with a pulse, I wanted to be my client. <laughs> I had no customer base. I needed the work. 
I think it's fair to say that you are working with a unique clientele, the the not just the higher end of the market, but the the very highest end of the market. Just out of curiosity, and you taught, and we'll get into the your career and the start of your career. But you mentioned being um, a, a commercial home builder and and moving into the luxury home building business. What's it like to deal with a clientele at at that high end of the market versus uh, say the extreme opposite or even somewhere in the middle? It's a balance between pure ecstasy and sheer terror. <laughs> it really is. And I, I think the pendulum swings both ways. The majority of our clients are heads of publicly and privately held companies. That's the good news. They, they want somebody who's going to own it and run it like a business. But the design team sometimes have 10, 12 different people on it, all the consultants and I have to tell you, they're very sophisticated, and depending on the architect, the client, all the design team people, it's complex to build these things. The project that I believe you're going to show later on is a three-year project that should have taken five years to build, and it had over three million labor hours in that project. Yeah. It's just a lot to coordinate. So it's probably pretty satisfying when you get that final sign off and the project's complete. You know, it used to be that. Um, but I think honestly what it is, it's the opportunity to get to be toe to toe with these CEOs. I didn't go to college, Brian, as you know, but I've had the most successful people in the world across the table from me toe to toe. And they really are willing to share in terms of help and there's not an issue I can't get resolved with a phone call. And it's it's been a blessing. And I, I have to tell you, I am more motivated by the relationships that we build with our trades, our employees, the clients. Some of them have ended up being business partners on different levels. And I don't know, it's, it's just exciting to do it. But in the end, we're serving them. We're building somebody else's vision. And I think that's what's compelling to me because I can tell you, I've got a good design sense, but I could never design a project like we build ever. Well, it sounds like you put a good team together and and I know that you're producing a very high quality product that your your customers and clients are pleased with. Jerry, I don't think I've ever met someone who seemed to know at such a young age what he was destined to do vocationally. You were only five years old when you started tagging along with your dad to construction job sites. In your book, Be Great Before It's Too Late, you wrote that you nailed down your first subfloor at the age of five. I didn't even know what a subfloor was until I was about 35. And you nailed down your first roof in the sixth grade. By the age of 18, you were in the carpentry business. You had gone into business, started Desert Star Construction, I guess, with your father. Share what it was like for you growing up. And at what point did you realize that you were called to be a builder? That's a very big question, so I'll try to distill it for you. I think the true reason that I was, my, I would get dropped off after kindergarten to go work on my dad's jobs. <laughs> and I think it was really because my mom didn't want me around. I know she loved me, but there was a level of dysfunction in our family. So I think what really, it what started first was a love for my dad that I could spend time with him and then always working for that approval of him, the attaboy. And he, my parents both had very challenging upbringings. A lot of, a lot of bad stuff happened to them, but they really did their very best with me and my brother and sister. And I'm thankful for it. Um, I think you've heard me say this in life. It's not what you accomplish that makes you successful. It's what you overcome. And they were both overcomers. So in my book, mom and dad were two of the most successful people I knew. But I think the biggest thing is my dad had some bad experiences in construction. And I was the compliant middle child in our family, just so you're aware of the personality types. Well, my dad always told me not to go into construction. He wanted more for me. It's hard. You're going to work a lot. There's no money in it, so on and so forth. Um, the Phoenix Business Gazette did an article on me called Rebellious Son. Because <laughs> they knew my dad didn't want me to go into construction. So I... I don't know if it was my rebellion or not. I just thought it was really cool to see something you accomplished at the end of the day. And I still feel that way. 
the, the accomplishments are different now when you've got so many people in your team doing the actual work, but the fulfillment is such, just as great. And to see our clients being the wealthiest in the world, they use their homes to raise funds for good causes. And I think that's really powerful. It's just more than just a home. It's a venue that where they can have their friends and family in for events too. That's really a great point. And I, I really hadn't thought about that. And I, I know that you create beautiful, as you have trademarked the, the term personal, uh, personal resort, but I didn't really think about that being a show place for uh, raising money. And of course, now that you say that, it, it just makes sense. And, and I have friends who have beautiful homes who, who use their homes um, for that purpose. And, and so to be a part of that is really, it, it's an added blessing. It, 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 really, it really is, Brian. And the, the people that I've been allowed to meet that I would never have met our governors and presidents or presidential candidates and things of that nature. It's, it's, it's fun. It sounds fun. You, you mentioned adversity and, and growing up and in your parents' situation growing up uh, compared to yours. DSC today is a phenomenally successful company, financially strong, I'm guessing. But the construction market, as you know, even as it relates to luxury home building, maybe especially as it relates to luxury home building, is a cyclical business. You've been in business for over 40 years. So I know you've experienced adversity um, just in your, I, I know you've had personal adversity too, but it, certainly adversity in your business. Tell us about a time when DSC wasn't doing as well and how were you able to weather the storm and what lessons did you learn from those downturns? Well, I guess I'm going to break that into two categories, the first 20 years and then what happened after that. First 10 years in business, my average income was ninety was $9,070 a year. My first 20 years in business was where my average uh, salary was $17,000 a year. So I wasn't making any money whatsoever. Um, but I had a, a back injury and I had to quit working like I always had worked before. And 18 months in traction will teach you how to get through something else. So instead of focusing on what I could do as Jerry with limited hours and even more limited physical abilities, I transformed that into what kind of a team can I build? And I'll tell you, it was amazing to get, instead of addition, it was multiplication in our business. Um, there's been a lot of different events that we've really hit us. And I'll tell you, 9-11, we are fortunate enough just to push right through that. 2008 and nine were brutal. We had $25 million in work cancel in a 45-day period. And that year, all we had signed was $25 million of work. So that was everything. Wow. And I think what it is, I'm a person of faith. Um, and I think that gets me through these challenges. But when I say that, I had to figure out what to do. I had quite a few employees. We had a great team, great subcontractors. And I just made a bold statement. I got my team together and I told everybody as other companies were going broke, people getting laid off, I said, I'm, I'm going to choose not to participate in this downturn. And I said, what does that mean? That means my wife and I aren't going to take a salary until things turn around. I had no idea what I was committing to, Brian. It was two years before Carol and I saw a dime and it took us a few years to catch up from that commitment. I'm so glad we did it. We reworked our entire process from the very first time we meet a client all the way through to operation, formed a concierge division that now takes care of the homes. You know, I would have never said that it was a good thing, but we learned a lot. And for me, I will never pick a fight with somebody, but everybody knows I'll never walk away from one either. Mm. So instead of being down and afraid, we turned into the storm. And we, we literally started demoing houses. The only thing that was going on was houses were on the market they wouldn't sell so i went to realtors found out about the tax deduction and we were tearing down really good homes but they were getting tax deductions from five hundred thousand to just under two million dollars and their their property sold almost instantly because people could see their own vision on that land so you just have to do things differently but uh, never run from the adversity ever well you've made some 
pretty bold leadership decisions and business decisions through the years. The, the one in 2008 was um, certainly bold. And to be successful for that length of time, your company really has to adapt, as you know, at different times. And the other thing, though, is that you've had to grow and adapt as a leader. How is your approach to leadership? You talked about uh, being laid up and, and having to, uh, because you couldn't go. I know you were always the first guy on the job site at three in the morning, the last guy at the job site, and then you'd go and probably do paperwork at night, which isn't a, an atypical um, story for someone in your position, especially in the early days. But you realized out of necessity that you couldn't continue to do that. And so you really, that, that forced you to adapt and, and really become more of a leader than I, I think the hands-on uh, manager or uh, project manager, probably. How has your approach to leadership and management evolved as DSC has grown? I think we, it's grown by virtue of sometimes what we knew and what we didn't know. I felt like I had to start being bigger on the inside than on the outside. And that was a lot of personal development, getting rid of things that didn't work. But in terms of the pivotal things for me, it became a perspective of having a values-based company and we put people before profits. And when I say that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, most people had a community that they were part of. There was a church, it was some organization, a club. People have gotten away from that now, and we took it upon ourselves at Desert Star to be that community. We did. We now have family fun weekends where we bring everybody and their children somewhere. We do something special. Um, we have a lot of events during the year, but that's the social side, the practical side. And this is something that I've just started doing this year with a renewed sense of urgency. We're investing more and more into our team members. And it's not just giving them a to-do list. I was the kind of leader and still am where you come alongside the people, Brian. You walk with them because I truly believe more is caught than taught. But I've got five amazing human beings right now, men in our company that I'm actually training. And I have to tell you, I'm having more fun than they are. Mm. They are all running projects, but... I didn't do a good job in formally training in them to do be a superintendent. So we're getting together, and I think it's the best thing I'm doing right now in business, investing in my team. And I think that, and that again, that'll turn into multiplication well, because it's a long term. Sure, and and I I smile when you say that you're having more fun than they are, because I bet if we brought them on the show and asked them, they would suggest that they're having more fun than you are. So that's a testament to your leadership, I think. Oh, thank you. I, um, thank you. One of the things we try to do on the show is, as you know, we bring people on the show who have achieved excellence in their chosen profession. And the, the takeaway that, that I always strive for, that I shoot for, is that our listeners and viewers learn tools and techniques and strategies from the guests on the show that they can then take and apply in their own lives. What are a couple of the most important leadership lessons you've learned or specific and stra specific strategies you've incorporated into your leadership? Things that for you today maybe are second nature, having been in business for over 40 years, but haven't always been that way. I think it's thinking more of others than yourself. And I think that comes with that level five leader, strong professional will, personal humility. That takes time to develop because honestly, that humility, you kind of, that's like the word in, um, integrity. There's a word in the Greek that relates to it. It's called a chisel. And a chisel takes away everything that doesn't belong. And I think it's a constant process. And by the way, I don't have it all figured out. I'm still a work in process too, Brian. But every day, I just take a little bit more of the garbage out and just like, what? who am I supposed to be as a leader and as a builder? But I think what it is, I think the main thing, one of the main things has been delegating the leadership. We have construction meetings. We have leadership meetings, my core group that we get together. And frankly, I think it's giving people a future, not just the job. And when we interview people, we ask them what they're after and what they want to do in five or 10 years. 
every once in a while, somebody will say they want my job. I said, you can have it if you can do it. So, um, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think in terms of leadership, the practical thing is like, for example, I our annual meeting this past year, I did some things that what I've learned from our clients and most of what I've learned, for example, our first publicly held client was Randy Knight. He was the chairman of Knight Transportation. They're a national trucking company. And I was just like a pig in slop. I didn't know why we even got the job. I said, why did you choose us? And he says, Jerry, he goes, you're the only builder that didn't impress me by dropping names of other people they built for. And I said, thank you. What Randy didn't know was I had no names to drop. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I learned from it, and I think what happens in these situations is you have to be aware of what's right in front of you instead of always going for the next thing. I have never brought up another client's name in an interview in 46 years because Randy taught me that. And I also learned in terms of pricing structures, we are not the cheapest, but I believe we offer more value, and as an entrepreneur business owner, it's not how much you charge. Can you justify the price? And for me, that was hard in terms of I didn't think we were that good. But at some point when profitability became an issue, I needed to figure out what are we doing that nobody else is doing and leverage that. So and it's even something I came to my mind just last Friday morning in my quiet time is it seems like we as business people are always chasing instead of embracing. Mm. And when I say that we're chasing the next client, the next employee, the bigger house, the car, and the list goes on and on, but that's a mirage. I think part of my success in leadership, Brian, has been I've, I've embraced what's in front of me. I've been able to learn from these CEOs, and, and I always ask them, too. And I think they like the humility because many of the CEOs, I remember when I was working with Don Ulrich, he was a senior VP of um, Coca-Cola. And I said, what do you like most about your job? He goes, I love the power. I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I learned a lot from him, and he taught me a lot. And for me, it's just been the opportunity to be in an environment, to be in a room. And I was a, I think, you know, my, this part of my history, I was a pretty insecure kid. We moved around a lot, never had friends, didn't have stability really at home some of the times. And to that end, I just was afraid to meet these people. And I just had to work through those insecurities and it took time, but we've all got stuff. And I think when we're thinking, what can we do for somebody instead of what can we get from them? That's pivotal in every business relationship that we have. Yeah. Those are all great takeaways, Jerry. Thanks for sharing those. Jerry, in addition to your successful career as a builder, you've also found time to write a few books. I, I love leadership on the level, and I'm going to go back and reread Be Great Before It's Too Late because it's just chock full of inspirational stories of men and women in history and the peaks and valleys they've experienced in their lives. I highly recommend that book for our listeners and viewers. You're a busy guy with a thriving business and a great family. What motivated you to become an author on top of those things? I don't know, because there's time when I think it was like the dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like building a house. It's harder, it takes longer, and it costs more money, right? <laughs> um, I think what it is, Mark Batterson, the author, said this once. He said that when a person dies, a library goes away. I want to tell your listeners, I don't think I'm a phenomenal author, but I think I've got some great stories of what's happened through my life, through my faith, how God's blessed me, and I want to share those. If I think it'll be more than my my kids and grandkids, but there's certain principles of leadership on the level. Honestly, that was that, and while you wait, were the byproduct of I was speaking on a to a group of pastors, and they were all talking about what are they going to do through COVID. I'm like, I think I'm going to write a book. <laughs> you know, I want to have an answer to that question. It's like everybody asks, where were you when 9-11 took place? I can tell you what job and what we were doing there. But I think what it is, I don't want to waste time. And when I get to the end of this journey, I want the well done. Yes. Not, hey, you could have, Jerry, but you didn't. 
So I've always erred on the side of action, even when I failed, and I failed a lot. Well, and that's another takeaway. I, I think in the Be Great book, I thought it was interesting how you talked about what greatness is. You wrote about that and shared stories of people we all recognize. But it was interesting that you started by sharing what greatness isn't and offered stories of men and women who were incredibly talented and phenomenally successful by worldly standards, but ended up falling short of their potential. Why was it important for you to not only help readers see the opportunities for greatness, but also share warnings about the obstacles we might face in our journey to living that life of greatness? That is a great question, Brian. Thank you. Because really, the motivation for that book, a friend of mine, he preached a message on that. It was at a college commencement. And the first thing I thought of was, Boy, I wish somebody would have told me those things when I was 18. Hmm. What's really important? And I got his permission to kind of steal his words to get started. And I ended up not using any of them hardly, but I just, in terms of integrity, and Jensen wrote the forward of the book for me. But it was, for me, I feel like it's it, every day it seems more visible that people are just chasing mirages. And even with this superintendent's class I told you about, I'm teaching with our team. The first half of every class is about character and integrity. Because if they don't have a personal foundation to carry the weight of leadership and the size of the projects that they do, they're going to crumble. And I think everybody is so concerned about, oh, you've got these shoes and this handbag and got a million followers. It's like, who cares? It's our personal greatness is what we do for others. Fame is what we do for ourselves. And you see these famous people, they don't have the foundation or the stability in their life, the priority in their life, they, they fall. And I'm far from perfect, and anybody who knows me well will tell you that. But I know I'm trying, and I think that's what I want to communicate, that who cares if you're a movie star? Um, I think Helen Keller was more successful than some of the famous actors. You know, or Corey Ten Boone, you, you pick a name. But I think what it is... In today's society, people are so focused on stuff and belongings and what other people think, we're not investing in ourselves. And the hardest person for anybody to lead is themselves. I'm a, I'm a walking testimony of that, Brian. <laughs> I, I, I think you're hard on yourself, Jerry. You're I'm very that. hard on myself. <laughs> I don't think I've ever really said this was a great project because I come in six months later. It's like, how did we miss that? Nobody sees it, but I see it. So. You've, you've mentioned your faith a couple times, and I, I know you're a man of faith, and you credit your relationship with Christ for, um, I, I think, all the success you've had, whether it's in your business or uh, personal life, family life, and also for many of the important lessons you've learned. Share more about God's influence in your life, if you would, and the impact he's had on you both personally and professionally. It's like everything in life. It's been a journey. And when I, even during the bullying part, and I shared a little bit of this, of this and be great, I think I was on school number seven or eight. I can't remember. And I was getting beat up and bullied. And I had this, I was one semester in Scottsdale, Arizona, on the way to upstate New York. And the teacher wrote me the most thoughtful letter. She says, Jerry, I don't know why this is happening to you. And I don't understand it, but I always want you to know that God plus one is a majority. Mm. And I have held on to those words my whole life. And at that point in time, we weren't going to church. There wasn't an emphasis on God. Yeah, I was raised Catholic, but there was nothing about a relationship with the Lord. And I think my faith has probably been the biggest impact on my business, Brian, in terms of generosity. Um, to me, generosity is the hallmark of faith. And I don't think it's just money. It's your time. It's your talents. It's helping others succeed. But there's been so many pivotal things where we've been allowed to help people. And that's the biggest thing. It's never the money you make. It's what are you going to do with it? And I, I can remember a friend of mine challenged me, says, Jerry, did you dedicate your business to the Lord? I said, yeah. And I feel pretty proud of myself. 
He goes, well, that's why you're not doing as good as you should. I said, excuse me? He goes, Jerry, it's all God's. You got to give the business to God and get out of the way. And that was pivotal for me. And it was a transition mentally, a lot of reading, a lot of prayer and trying to understand things, good conversations with quality people. But my takeaway from that was I had to stop asking God to bless what I was doing and start asking God, what do you want me to do? And I will tell you, at that point in time, I think I had it all figured out, but nah. Once I took that, our income, our income and revenue went up four times. And where was that time-wise in, in the history of Desert Star? That was probably almost 30 years into a 46-year career. Wow. And But even that, I think part of it is, I don't do this every year, but probably every other year, I read one chapter of Proverbs every day in the Message Bible, which I can understand. Um, not King James, it's kind of like, I think he's dead, so we have hundreds of choices now for Bibles. But I think what it is, it keeps you grounded. It talks about how you trust in God, how you treat people. It talks about success in business, that the gen- that people that are generous will be made fat. And uh, you go through all these things. It's, it's, a, it's serving something bigger than yourself, but there's a roadmap on how to do it. And that's what the Bible has been for me. Yes. What do you make about the fact that Jesus was a carpenter and and you were our carpenter? Is that just a coincidence? Well, first of all, I think all ministers should have real jobs. I didn't say that. No, being a pastor, I love pastors, got close friends, but they work. I have to tell you, Brian, I went through a time in my life, I didn't feel like I wanted to be a builder anymore. I didn't feel like it was dignified. I always thought I'd be in a suit, running a publicly held company and doing some amazing things. But that wasn't my path and it wasn't my choice that I pursued. But I think what happened is it was my sister over a cup of coffee said, Jerry, builders are builders of men. There's builders of buildings. There's builders in the church talking about temples being built. And frankly, I think it's pretty cool that Jesus was a carpenter. He had to get materials. He had to negotiate contracts. He had to work with people. And look what one man did, how he changed the world. So I don't know. I I think it's cool. There's so many examples of builders and even builders that when the temple was being built and they went overseas to get materials, there's the way to get the best people and the best product. Yes. Jerry, you've been obviously blessed with an incredible life, and you mentioned generosity a, a while ago. And I know at this stage in your life, you're in the process of moving from success to significance, and you've been extremely generous with your time and money and helping others. One example of that, and I mentioned it briefly when I introduced you, is your work with the Phoenix Dream Center. Tell us more about the great work they're doing and the impact the Dream Center has on rescuing and caring for victims of human trafficking. Now, that's great. I've been off the board for a few years, but still in relationship with Pastor Tommy and Brian, who's the manager there, and still support it in different ways. But I think what it was, it was part of, so 2008, we had the we're not going to participate conversation. Well, we had helped financially to buy the Dream Center. We were one of many who did that. And our son was started his freshman year in college, and he was borrowing equipment, needed trucks. And yeah, sure, go ahead, because none of these people had driver's license. They're trying to clean it up, get it ready for your occupancy. And Jeremy says, hey, Dad, I know you and Mom like helping organizations, and we need some kitchen equipment. And I'm like, okay. I said, you know the drill? He goes, how many prices do I have to get? He said, give me two. And I think we're looking at $40,000. So I figured for $40,000, I'm going to go down and take take a look at it. And I know the Bible talks about how Jesus was moved with compassion. I, I, I was so touched by what they were doing down there and to see people that just needed a meal. And I said, Jeremy, I can't make the decision today. I want to set up a meeting with the leadership here. 
long story short, they had a functionally obsolescent kitchen that wasn't being used. They had a little game room that they were grilling, setting up. They needed a new kitchen. So effectively, I got the team together and I said, what do you want? What are your needs? And we fully funded a, a commercial kitchen in there, which basically the capacity was a million meals a year. Wow. But as of the end of last year, we've served over 11 and a half million meals. And not all the meals are cooked and served there. They take them out to other homeless people. Because part of Pastor Tommy, Tommy Barnett's vision wasn't to give a handout, but a hand up. Yes. And that was meaningful to me. Well, fast forward a little bit. One of our two of our clients were on the board for Phoenix Children's Hospital here. And I don't know what they do in your area, but they got 20 interior designers to decorate Christmas trees. And they were going to auction off. Effectively, I got in, Carol, my wife and I were able to attend. None of the designers were there, which was kind of an interesting perspective because that was one of the main reasons I wanted to go. Um, but as we left, I told Carol, I said, Carol, I said, I don't know why this is on my mind, but I'm not. And by the way, my creativity comes in execution, leadership architect, if you will. We can figure anything out, but to come up with that idea, that's not me. I feel like really God dropped a little nugget in my head. I said, I think I want to reach out to the Dream Center and get 10 rooms. He says, for what? I want to get 10 interior designers. Well, I wanted to, we were going to actually fund all this. And by the way, it was think 2009. Nobody had any work either. So why would anybody help? We didn't just affect ourselves. We infected, affected our industry and our community. We had 10 interior designers, 30 trade contractors that we worked with, 300 companies and 1,000 volunteers, and in 72 business days from asbestos removal to photography, it was done. And I will tell you, both of those things are the two most worthwhile things I've ever done. We've given a lot of money, but these are things that are working every day helping people. There's a return on that investment every day. And just so you know, we I believe there's been over 2,300 women now rescued from trafficking. And the number I never even thought was on the radar or would be, I think it was 285 babies were born through there. Oh, my goodness. To the think I have that kind of impact. But the community just came together. Everybody wanted to help. People said, no one's ever asked me to do something before. I said, well, I can help with that. <laughs> so, but. But that's what it was. But the Dream Center continues on now with people aging out of foster care. And they've just got great programs. The community, they've got a medical center now. Get your hair cut. The victims of human trafficking and get their their brands off the tattoos. Get those removed. And it's really become a community effort. And even Grand Canyon University gives scholarships now, helps them finish their GEDs. It's, it's a movement more than it's just a, a way to help people. Boy, what a great organization and how awesome to be involved in it and and to have planted some of those seeds a long time ago and, and see the fruits of that labor. How do you integrate generosity into your, your business? Is that something that you're intentional about weaving that? I, I'm sure you it, it's woven throughout the fabric of, of your business in terms of your giving in, in your time, but is that something that you promote on, within your team as well? 100%. But the first thing we are, we're generous with our employees because nobody wants to work for somebody who's taking care of everybody else but the families that are in our, in our team. So we've got a lot of things that we've done. Some of them, I think, were genius and others. We just did them and it turned out to be a good idea. And I won't give you the 20 things we failed epically at. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of generosity with our company, we We've helped people get their citizenship. We have an annual budget for their continuing education. We've actually just entered this start of this year. We figured we need to do more. And there's a lot of tension and a lot of things going on in the world. We now have counseling that they can go to if it's marriage for, we have financial help for them in terms of planning, stock programs. We're the top half of a percent on how the benefits work in our company. We figure first we have to invest in our family at work, then we take it elsewhere. 
it was our team that helped us do that Dream Center Kitchen and our team that helped us do the um, rescue project, Rooms for Victims of Human Trafficking. And what was really cool, our team members brought their spouses, brought their kids, and taught them generosity. And for me, I everybody's got their own faith to walk. I do not push my faith down anybody's throat. We all have a choice, and I'm of the believer that if we're of the belief that if we're supposed to be salt and light, people are going to want to know what's different about us. And in terms of being an employer, we have to operate with a level of integrity and fairness with our people. Because if we don't take care of them, you can say all you want about Jesus dying on a cross and what how great it is to be a Christian. But if they're not seeing the fruits of those labors in my life, my team's life, it's hypocritical. Yeah, that's well said. Jerry, we've been talking about a life of greatness. And our show, as you know, is called Life Excellence. Now, greatness and excellence are certainly related. But I'm curious, what does excellence mean to you? Wow, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. I wasn't sure how to answer it. <laughs> now, Brian, I, to me, excellence is a process. And I can kind of rewind back. We, we've we hired a lot of people with college degrees from the construction school, and they do a great job for us. We've also got guys like me that didn't go to college, and I think it takes everybody. I had a young gentleman who got his uh, master's degree out of uh, Michigan, in construction management, he asked me if he could see my business plan. And because we're, you know, we've got a couple of houses, there are two of them simultaneously bigger than the White House being built. I think if you're 26, 27, you're like, how did this guy do this? And uh, again, I, it's God who gave us the opportunities and the strength and the vision to get through them. But I told him, I said, I didn't have a business plan. I hope you're not disappointed in me. And he just looked at me, he goes, really? I said, yeah. And I akin this to your question about excellence, Brian. I feel like what I told him is I did my best every day. I didn't caught up thinking about what I didn't have, what was the next step, because I would have missed the current step. And yeah, our runway was probably longer than a lot of guys, but our duration in business is longer than most of them. There's not a lot of companies that, that do what we do that are still around. We've turned it into a professional service business that builds homes. So in short, what excellence is to me, it's doing your best every day, but being taking that excellence and making yourself bigger on the inside, then take what you've got on the inside and put that as a practical application to your own family and to your own business. And I think that's excellence is just doing your best with what you have. There's... I. I with publicly held CEOs financially. I mean, I was literally, I was sitting across from two billionaires having a dinner with our wives a few weeks ago and I chuckled and I said, they said, what's so funny? I said, well, you're worth 8 billion and you've got a billion dollars going on. And I said, I'm Jerry. And I'm like, so what's so funny about that? I said, none of us went to college. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, don't use the lack of education as a crutch that your listeners you read every book you can. You meet people that will reach out and talk to you. Um, I've paid for lunches just to get wisdom. I will do that. And I think from that perspective, excellence is just a belief that there's more out there and that you can achieve more if you're willing to invest in yourself. Yeah, that's great insight, Jerry. As someone who's built an incredible legacy in the construction business, what are you most proud of? I would have to say almost 44 years of marriage to the same woman, um, two amazing sons, one who two and a half years ago became president of our largest company and another one who's a rock star and he's in commercial work, which we don't do, but he's a talent in himself and now have our first grandchild coming within a week. And our oldest son, Jeremy, got married to a wonderful woman, Yaz, and she's She's great. So I think for me, it's not the projects we built. It's the people relationships. And it's the fact that I can invest what I've learned and lived into other people and hopefully make a difference in their lives. To me, that's what I'm most proud of. 
um, yeah, we built some really cool stuff and I get excited. When I was on a job this morning before this interview taking place now, it's on 10 acres and probably 50,000 square feet. And I was exhausted, a lot going on, but I got to catch up with all the guys and their families and how they're doing. And it's the, it's people, people, people for me. The profits have always followed. That's super. And by the way, congratulations on uh, being a soon to be grandfather. You're absolutely going to love it. I can relate to everything that you said regarding people. And I have a 15 month old granddaughter and it, it takes the whole um, r relationship game to uh, an entirely different level. And you're certainly going to enjoy that. Uh, thank you. We're we're excited. Uh, we really are. Suppose do Easter Sunday. We'll see. I don't know when this is going to broadcast, but we'll give you an update. <laughs> oh, that's great, Jerry. This has been terrific. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's great to see you and connect with you again. And I really appreciate everything that you've shared on the show today. Uh, thank you, Brian. It's again, and I said at the beginning, it's an honor. I've always had a high esteem and respect for you and what you're doing in business and in life and where we met and it, it's been good. And I look forward to seeing you in person again soon. I look forward to that as well. And you know, I feel the same way about you, Jerry. Oh, thank Thanks you. for tuning into Life Excellence. Please support the show by subscribing, sharing it with others, posting about today's show with luxury home builder, Jerry Meek on social media and leaving a rating and review. You can also learn more about me at brianbardis.com. Until next time, dream big dreams, and make each day your masterpiece.